Hello and welcome to the Data Engineering Podcast, the show about modern data management. When you're ready to build your next pipeline, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so you should check out Linode. With private networking, shared block storage, node balancers, and a 40 gigabit network, all controlled by a brand new API, you've got everything you need to run a bulletproof data platform. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Linode to get a $20 credit and launch a new server in under a minute. And for complete visibility into the health of your pipeline, including deployment tracking and powerful alerting driven by machine learning, Datadog has got you covered. With their monitoring, metrics, and log collection agent, including extensive integrations and distributed tracing, you'll have everything you need to find and fix performance bottlenecks in no time. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash datadog today to start your free 14-day trial and get a sweet new t-shirt. And go to dataengineeringpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the newsletter, read the show notes, and get in touch. Your host is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Pete Cheslock and Pat Cable about the data infrastructure and security controls at ThreatStack. So, Pete, could you start by introducing yourself? Yeah, hello. I am Pete Cheslock, and I currently run the technical operations for ThreatStack. And Pat, how about yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Patrick Cable. I do uh, a little bit of everything. Um, so I do security operations uh, and all the sec devops things here at ThreatStack. I thought it was devops sec. Who knows? Sec <laughs> we're, we're, still figure, we're still figuring that one out. I, I think everyone's still figuring that one out. Valid point. <laughs> and Pete, going back to you, how did you first get involved in the area of data management? I guess by accident, really. Um, you know, the... The, the sheer fact of joining ThreatStack almost four years ago in, in kind of the type of data and everything that we, we store, we, we keep a lot of data, we process a lot of data. Um, it's definitely the most um, that I've kind of dealt with, I think at this point, at least by, um, by sheer kind of event count. Um, but a previous company I was at, a company called Sonian, we were an email archiving company. And uh, the, if you think like email archiving, the, the number of kind of events uh, like emails would be a lot less than kind of a security event. Um, but um, the amount of data emails take up, if you think like PDF attachments and other things were petabytes. So we were, we were storing uh, a significant more amount of data then, just not as many kind of individual items as we do today. Different, different types of scale, scale, I guess. And Pat, how about you? How did you get involved in the area of data management? <laughs> uh, strictly along the ride here at ThreatStack, right? So um, one of the things that I care about is security time series data, right? So um, seeing when stuff happens on servers, and that actually kind of dovetails nicely into to what ThreatStack does, right? So we capture system calls uh, and other data about your, your EC2 and uh, actually just not just EC2, but any infrastructure you know, running our agent. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of along for the ride when it comes to data management, because uh, I have to make sure that we're securing all of it properly. And so, as you mentioned, ThreatStack is a platform and service for being able to capture event data within an infrastructure and your network environment for being able to analyze that for intrusion detection. And I'm wondering if you can provide some compare and contrast between the system and offerings that ThreatStack provides versus what the existing landscape was at the time when it was first started in terms of either open source or hosted options for doing the same kind of analysis of determining what threats might be present within an infrastructure or network environment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so one of the big things that I think differentiates us is a lot of the existing solutions would focus on logs, right? You know, somebody decided to log out some information and, you know, there are existing solutions that will collect and aggregate all that log data. And all that log data is, is, is really good stuff, right? It's, it's really important. You, you want to be capturing that log data. But the thing that always kind of fell short for me for log data was, you know, what about stuff that I'm not logging, but I want to know what's happening on the system? What is somebody logging into the server and actually running and executing, right? So the thing that I found very exciting about ThreatStack was that we could do something like, have an agent collect all the syscalls, which is, you know, for folks that might not know what syscalls are, it's the base kernel actions for doing anything in Linux, right? So 
you know, let's say that I run an application, I run a Ruby script, right? I'm going to be calling exec to Ruby, um, which is an action that I might care about. I'm going to be running open on the actual Ruby script itself and so on and so forth. So our advantage, I think, is that we collect all of that system call data and all the parameters that go with it and then can start constructing a, a timeline almost of what people are doing on these servers. Yeah, the from the open source component, so when I started here in 2014, and I was part of the kind of the pre-launch team, so really very early in the threat stack um, kind of timeline, the closest competitor was kind of open source concepts around um, Audit D. So in the very beginning, the threat stack product was kind of an Audit D replacement and cloud hosted. So we would um, have our own agent, which basically worked like Audit D, but uh, much better. And we would collect, like Pat said, all of these system calls and ingest them into our platform, doing kind of analysis and um, determining what's going on, trying to answer that question of like who did what when. Uh, of course, as we've grown over the last four years, we've added in a lot more features, which kind of kind of blurs the line of like what other alternatives are out there because we can do things like vulnerability assessment. We can integrate with um, Amazon specifically around CloudTrail. We can suck in those events and, and, and make sense of them. And, um, you know, doing other things like threat intelligence, intelligence detection and, um, and, and really trying to, we use the word, the word inform a lot, you know, trying to like inform our customers into anomalies in their environment. Yeah, yeah. so the one that I think of is you know you have a web server running and uh, maybe it hasn't been patched in a while and all of a sudden you see your web server process fork bash like that's probably bad <laughs> yeah i'd say that's not good maybe it makes a connection to like a ip in china too like that would be pretty bad take your pick <laughs> so um, being able to kind of alert on those too right so there's like events and we capture a lot of events and then customers will write rules to bring those events to uh, SEV1, SEV2, SEV3. And the focus seems to be largely around the hosts and the processes that are executing on those hosts. And I'm wondering how, I'm wondering whether ThreatStack has any overlap with tools such as Snort or Suricata, which are more for detecting inbound network connections, largely with a firewall oriented perspective built into the way that the tool was originally designed or whether tools like that really even make much sense in more modern cloud environments or if those are more of an artifact of the data center oriented infrastructure. What's pretty funny is that the founders of ThreatStack actually created an open source project called Snorby, which was Snort but like on Ruby on Rails. So it was like a Ruby on Rails tool for managing Snort kind of data. And even if you go back to the very early, kind of before I started, threat stack ideas that the founders had, um, the initial idea was kind of a, a place that uh, people could uh, pull in Suricata and, and Snort and other kind of intelligence data, I guess, in, in order to understand, you know, what was going on in their environment. Um, only later when they realized that the value really was in um, being able to kind of have an agent that can capture this data off the host directly and try to tie that in. Um, that's when they really started going down that path. But you know, to be honest, I can't I can't really speak for you know some of those tools. I haven't used them in years at this point, um, and how they've kind of aged for the more I don't know we call it cloud native world, right? Where where hosts are very ephemeral. They come and they go. Um, you don't have the the long lived instances of of your for the most part. You know, one thing that strikes me is when you look at some of these network based tools. It's, it's interesting to see, you know, host has connected to thing, um, but without the surrounding context of what's running on the machine, you know, the next place an analyst is going to go is, okay, so let me figure out what on the machine made that connection. Yeah, what and, was the process that was on that machine? Who, who ran that process? What user ran that process? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting to me that... These tools certainly serve a purpose, and I think they serve a, a, a bigger purpose when you have longer-lived instances. And now when we're talking about cloud, instances may come and go. You might not necessarily know what was run on them. You know, it, It's a little bit of a harder sell, I think, uh, for those other tools. And in terms of the 
types and structure of the data that you're collecting with your agents. I'm wondering if you can describe what the typical events would look like and what the flow is for when the event is captured on the host via the agent uh, all the way through to uh, you storing and analyzing and potentially alerting on it. Ooh, so yeah. many pipelines. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of stuff <laughs> to that one. That's I'll yeah, I'll give it a shot here. Um, so the type of data, like Pat was saying, are essentially Linux system calls, network connections, process connections. There's a few more things. We do something called file integrity monitoring, which is where we can put watches on kind of key files in your infrastructure so that uh, maybe like an SSL key or a configuration file that has like a database password in it. We can put a watch on those files um, and then when a process accesses them, we will um, we'll be able to see which process accessed which file, like if, if, if you had a watch on it. So, um, you know, Agent events, that's kind of one type of event we, we capture, and then CloudTrail events would be other ones. Um, the nice thing about CloudTrail events is that they're they're pretty standard. You know, people turn on CloudTrail for AWS, which is like an API auditing, for lack of a better term, of like your, your API usage on, on AWS. But on the agent side, at least, um, you know, the, the data, that's what we consider to be much more real time. Um, CloudTrail events that we consume, there's a delay that it takes for Amazon even to put the CloudTrail events in your in your S3 bucket. Um, once they're in the bucket, then they're in our infrastructure very quickly. But it's actually the agent events which poses the um, the largest kind of technological challenge for us because if if you have for every process you could have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of of syscalls associated with it, or every time maybe your process forks or uh, opens a connection, you know, there's multiple system calls associated. And so the ultimate goal in the very early days and continues on to this day of ThreatStack is to always be consuming this data because they are, they're all potentially security events and to, uh, to process it, you know, as fast as possible. Um, you know, at a high level, you know, the agent will send this data to, into ThreatStack and, and we run on Amazon Web Services. We're very big fans of, of using um, AWS. And, um, you know, the data comes into our environment. And of course, the evolution of our, uh, of our platform has changed over time. You know, at a, at a real high level in the past, we, we used to use um, a lot more of RabbitMQ. Um, so if you kind of rewind back to 2014 when I started, um, you know, we're, we were bringing in um, RabbitMQ essentially as a way to replace uh, zero MQ, which was the original like messaging layer of kind of the threat stack platform. We ran into a lot of issues with zero MQ at the scale, even the scale we were at in the very early days. And so RabbitMQ at the time, uh, myself and um, our CTO at the time, you know, we, we had a lot of historical experience with RabbitMQ and scaling RabbitMQ was something I wasn't really too worried about. Um, so we decided to bring that in. A lot of times people are always saying, oh, well, why not Kafka? Well, 2014 was a different time. I don't even know what version Kafka was, but to be honest, I'm, I wasn't willing to bet a company on something that that new. Um, but again, fast forward to 2018, and now we have multiple Kafka clusters that we're actually bringing in place um, that are replacing a lot of the pieces of kind of what we would call our old RabbitMQ infrastructure. But if you think of it like like the the data pipelines is kind of how we talk about it internally. You know, data is essentially getting published to these. Kafka topics, and then we can have lots of different processes or you know microservices. I think is the the new That's fancy the, term. That is the new fancy term. You yes. know, so you have these microservices that are you know accessing all this data in Kafka and then uh, analyzing it and doing different rollups and things like that using um, some tools like Spark. I think more recently we've been using tools like Flink uh, for. Um, kind of rolling up data or doing, I don't know if you'd call it like batch processing. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, rollups. And then uh, under the assumption, let's say one of these security events uh, triggers an alert, you know, then we can like tie into third party services and like Slack, for example, or HipChat, um, or even like PagerDuty. We could send a message to PagerDuty and, and alert you if, let's say, someone installs like a kernel module in your environment, which that's you know, not good. Usually not a good thing. <laughs> Unless you're doing embedded development, I guess, but. <laughs> and there are a lot of different topics out of that that we can go into. And to start with, I'm wondering 
how you ensure that the event data that you're being delivered has a consistent format so that it's easy to uh, manage that as it traverses your various pipelines and so that you can ensure that you have the necessary information from source to destination. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, our first step when we take this data in is to basically make sure that it matches our expectation for what this data is, right? So we have a service that its job is to figure out what is the, you know, to make sure that the data is in the right format. Yeah, the, I guess the, the best part about having our own agent versus like audit D. A lot of times people said, oh, well, you're, it sounds like a lot like Audit D. And at a really high level, many years ago, our agent looked similar to Audit D, except it was built to be much more performant. Uh, the biggest difference, though, especially in those early days, it's, it's much different now because we're doing a lot more. But the if you've ever looked at like Audit D log formats, um, it's like multi-line. Um, it comes in out of order. Um, it's, it's just very difficult to parse in many ways. You'd have to correlate multiple log lines in order to get the full concept of, a, of an event, right? With uh, our agent, we actually take this data and um, store it as a JSON object and store things like the process name, the port right, number, right. if it was a connection, right? Or like an IP address. Um, and like Pat was saying, we'll have these services that can not only ensure that like the data is in the format we expect, but like also do kind of like data sanitization. Um, we ran into weird issues where um, the Linux kernel, like we just take what's coming off the Linux kernel. It's actually the audit APIs we interface with. Um, but the Linux kernel is, I don't know, not great. There's, well, there's a lot of cooks in that kitchen. There's a lot of cooks in that kitchen. That's a good way to put it. So we've seen scenarios where you might get a process ID that's completely out of range um, or a negative number uh, from the Linux kernel. And so, you know, how do you, how do you deal with that, right? So we have to do some like data sanitization to, to make sure that like further on down, you know, down other data pipelines, like we don't run into issues with that. Like expecting a, a, a process ID within some, some, I guess, normal range and have it come back to us as like or for, Unicode or something like that. <laughs> yeah, or, uh, you know, the source port, you know, for example, making sure that it is actually a valid port from zero to 65535 versus like negative nine. Well, actually, and that <laughs> leads me into a hilarious story of our, when we first launched our, we called it our limited availability. It was like the month before public availability launch. Um, I was actually not there for that launch. Uh, my son was being born at the time. So I basically at like 4 a.m. went to the hospital with my wife and said, good luck. I'll see you in a couple weeks. And uh, when they launched the limited availability, um, some data getting sent from an agent was completely malformed. And they had to track <laughs> it down to find out what agent it was. Turned out actually to be my test agent that was running at the time on an IRC bouncer. And it was <laughs> doing exactly like that, like what Pat said, which was it was sending like uh, a port number of, you know, like, I don't know, 30 million or something, like some insane number that like, in, in no way is, is real. It's like one of those IPv8 ports. <laughs> um, IPv8. Yeah, I, I think the we're in a very unique position to, like Pete said earlier, you know, we do have our own agent. So it's not that we wouldn't do sanitization because that scares me as a security person. Uh, it's just that we get to be more strict about what we accept in the first place, which is a nice place to be in. And playing again off of your story of having to track down where the particular data was coming from, what mechanisms do you have in place to ensure the provenance of the data that you are collecting and ensure that the chain along which it's being delivered is verifiable so that you don't have anybody maliciously injecting false data into your system? Yeah, so it's there's, there's a lot there. Um, a lot of the stuff around agent auth is could be a whole nother podcast, um, but we do have, uh, you know, a authentication structure within our agent that makes it so that both sides have to compute something to, to figure out what is, you know, the data is associated with that agent ID, and that's a that's a big part. Um, but also, you know, as we go down and, and we build services out, you know, security has been something that we've been. Uh, you, Part of our organization since the start um, and we've only made more of a commitment to that you know as we've built out our security team so um, you know we have 
a lot of work that goes into, you know, how do we, how do all these microservices talk to each other and ensure that, you know, the requesting organization and the requesting user makes sense for the data that co that's coming back. Um, and so, you know, we do a lot of work in making that, uh, making that story and in, in that uh, performant, you know, um, it's, it's an important thing because, you know, obviously it would be a very bad thing if one, you know, user's data went to another user, right? That's, that's, that is a pretty big failure. Um, and so, yeah, we've, we've put a lot of stuff in code to basically make sure that, you know, the requesting organization, the requesting user makes sense for the data that comes back and we check it on the way back out too, which is kind of neat. Yeah, I guess ensuring that, um, the data coming from a series of agents. So if you think of it like associating, you have a customer, uh, they'll have an organization that's kind of a top level idea of ThreatSack where you'll have an organization. What's actually very cool about how we've designed the product is that you might have a, maybe a large company with a lot of different organizations with different pieces of infrastructure. Let's just think at a very basic level, you might have a dev environment and a prod environment. Um, the alerts and the rules that you define within the prod environment might actually be different than dev, um, but maybe you run ThreatStack across both, which uh, a lot of our customers do. And so you could kind of have one customer with multiple organizations, but uh, we do a lot of interesting things on the encryption side as well to ensure that as data is landing in our environment, that it gets encrypted with kind of this like organizational key, um, not even like an account, like a, a customer specific one, it's really down to the organizational level. Um, what's really interesting about that as well is that, that we can ensure that like once a customer is long, no longer with us, we can just shred keys as a way of removing any sort of access to that data. Yeah. And going deeper on the idea of having your agents deployed across multiple environments within a given organization, what types of contextual data or additional formatting or even rate limiting of the data do you provide to the end user for being able to manipulate how the information is generated and what additional context is contained within the events that get delivered? Yeah, I mean, so we don't really focus on, you know, we want to be able to ca capture all of those events, right? Because if there's too much control on the user side, it would be trivial for an adversary to go in and say, like, great, don't send any events. Like, um, yeah, we really try to we treat the kernel as the source of truth. So if it comes off the kernel, then the goal is to essentially get it to our infrastructure without modification. Yeah. Now that said, you know, there are ways in which, you know, we can, you know, if we know and a customer reaches out to us and says like, Hey, you know, this particular command is, is kind of sensitive or like the inputs to this command will be sensitive, then that's something we work on on a case by case basis. But it's, that's actually a really good point, which is, you know, you might have a customer who says, um, I, I have some processes and, you know, PCI related or something. And, you know, I don't know, like you, you, well, HIPAA you're passing, is the one that comes to mind, yeah. right? Like you're, you're processing data in some sort of, you know, or like an argument, grid. like, and like the an argument arguments. is the patient name. Right? Yeah. So like, let's say you have a command that runs, we capture not only the command, but all the arguments associated with it. You'd want to know like what flags maybe were passed to a command or if bin bash was executed with some other service, right? That would kind of be an argument. And so for some customers, they say, oh, well, the way that this application works is we pass essentially PII as the arguments say to us like, well, how do we, how do we ensure this data actually never leaves our environment? And so we actually have some, some kind of filtering technology on the agent side where customers could kind of define what is PII for their environment to kind of re remove the likelihood of leaking uh, kind of sensitive data. Yeah. But that said, you know, that's a very small amount of our customers. Most of our customers yeah. want that, that full visibility and just want everything coming off the kernel. Um, to show up in their interface. Yeah, we often refer to it as a fire hose. It truly is um, a fire hose of data in many ways. <laughs> and with how much volume of data you're working with and the various different pieces of how that data is flowing through your system, how do you ensure an appropriate level of consistency and scalability in the actual underlying infrastructure that you're deploying and ensuring that the systems are operating as intended? Yeah, that's a great question. 
the there's an animated GIF that I use often when I talk about how to scale on the cloud, and it's a picture of um, uh, it, I think it's from I don't even know what cartoon it's from, but it's like the old lady from like Tweety Bird, I think, throwing money into a fire, just like money to oh, her into yeah. the fire, and I use it often. So I guess one benefit of using the cloud is getting more cloud is is usually not too hard. Of course, there's instance limits you have to watch out for, but you know if you have money, Amazon will happily take your money for more cloud. Um, so that's obviously one big place. We we scale up hundreds hundreds and upon hundreds of nodes maybe to, to handle scale events, scale back down when we're done processing. Um, you know, but for the most part, the the load as as data is coming into our environment, you know, we use um, probably our, our largest databases that we use are um, you know open source databases like uh, Cassandra or Elasticsearch. Um, Cassandra is great because it allows us to do quorum writes, which uh, from a data dur durability standpoint, we can run across multiple availability zones or multiple regions to ensure uh, kind of the durability of the data. So we won't acknowledge a write of data uh, unless it has written to multiple uh, Cassandra racks is the term, right? And so a rack for us might be like another AZ or another region. Um, Elasticsearch has something similar where you can do fun things around kind of primary and replica shards where you can say like a replica shard can't live in the same rack as a primary. So we essentially do the same thing. Um, and that's been a big help. Kafka too as well. Actually, one of the biggest benefits of Kafka is that ability to um, do quorum writes where you can not acknowledge a write into a Kafka cluster unless it has um, written to multiple, uh, again, same idea, racks, uh, availability zones, regions, things like that. And on the subject of your migration from RabbitMQ to Kafka, I'm wondering what you have found to be the benefits, whether it's in terms of cost savings, either time or monetary, or simplification of the overall deployment or management of the actual infrastructure or any other tertiary benefits. Sweet, sweet durability. Yeah. <laughs> RabbitMQ, and I say this as someone I've been using RabbitMQ for... I don't know, almost a decade for a very long time. So RabbitMQ is something I have a lot of comfort in running. Um, if you actually rewind back to um, when I was at a company called Sony and RabbitMQ was one of the core pieces of infrastructure to the point that when we built out and open sourced Sensu, the monitoring platform, we used RabbitMQ for transport of essentially monitoring events. Um, and if you are a Sensu user, you know, RabbitMQ is still an option uh, until the new version of, of Sensu comes out. And so when we brought on RabbitMQ initially, you know, some of the, the challenges of RabbitMQ scale and durability comes to just how to uh, do replicated queues. Um, and they've, they've done a lot of improvement around there, but it still kind of suffers from, from maybe the same idea as like Elasticsearch, where you don't have an idea of like quorum rights, where you can't ensure rights across multiple places, um, you know, in, in, in that, um, in the same way that, that services like Kafka and Cassandra do, uh, do. And, and maybe that's the case. It's, maybe it's better now. Honestly, I haven't looked too recently at, at the more more bleeding edge versions of RabbitMQ. For us, the main reason of moving it was essentially data durability. Um, we wanted to have a higher degree of, of understanding that the rights into Kafka were secure. But one of the actually the interesting parts of, around the original uh, RabbitMQ architecture was um, the way in which we uh, ensured that um, you know, we could scale it is we basically created this concept of pods and this is before Kubernetes was around. So we we're like the hipsters, I guess, of the, the term pod. But we have an internal term of a pod, which is a, a RabbitMQ with a, a series of services kind of wrapped around it. And so those turn into our individual scale points where if we need to run more scale through a single RabbitMQ, because um, there are going to be upper bounds uh, just based on the, the, the size of the instance, we can basically duplicate these pods and we could run you know, five pods or 10 pods, and we can span these pods across availability zones as a way of, of cop, you know, essentially writing bits across multiple places. But the, the ultimate issues why we decided to move off of it was we were building out um, new infrastructure a couple of years ago, and it was essentially how we um, manage alerting our customers when a security event occurs. And you can imagine an alert 
sending an alert that a security event occurred or that a specific system call was a anomaly, you know, sending that alert is, is of high priority. So, and, and, and the durability needs of that were, um, we need to be much greater than honestly, we, we believe that we could have gotten out of RabbitMQ at the time. Um, so that was a big reason to move there. Now, the benefits have been, it is um, significantly more performant than RabbitMQ for, again, our load type. Uh, we actually ran into a lot of issues, which um, again, mostly just how we're using RabbitMQ, but under scenario, this kind of scenarios we ran into that we felt a lot of pain and talking with other users of RabbitMQ at certain levels of scale, they kind of have shared similar thoughts. But when you are, uh, you have a very loud producer. So you have concept of a producer or something that puts something on RabbitMQ, a queue or an exchange that writes to a queue and then a consumer. Under scenarios where you have a lot of data, the consumer could actually get blocked on the producer's rights. And so how this kind of manifests is you're writing in a lot of data onto an exchange and the queue, the, the consumer on the queue that might be, list, that might be part of that exchange um, is actually unable to keep up uh, with processing data. And it's um, the only way to kind of solve this is like we, we do some kind of uh, magic with our service discovery where we, we essentially like move a, an entire pod out of commission so that it can essentially catch up as and we might bring in um, kind of net new pods into our infrastructure. So Kafka has yet to, to run into that same issue because of, of its write patterns and read patterns. Obviously, there's totally different load patterns and, um, you know, kind of scale uh, intricacies of Kafka that I'm sure a lot of people talk about more recently. But um, so far, as and I'm a, I'm a technology hater, um, I, I feel like there's, uh, there's a lot of stuff out there and, you know, on a long enough timeline, all software is terrible. But uh, I'm actually really pleasantly surprised by Kafka in, in its improvement for kind of our use case, at least, of, of you know, kind of having a, a, a stream of time series data, essentially, that we're processing. Uh, and in terms of the analysis and determining when to alert your users, I'm wondering how you determine when something is a potential threat or whether you have any sources of uh, data that you use to create these signatures of what an attack might look like, particularly given the continually evolving landscape of security threats and new types of attacks. We don't, so we don't use signatures, and that's always been something we talk about a lot, is that we're essentially kind of behavior-based, right? Like identifying maybe risky behaviors that could lead to a breach. Um, the goal being is you obviously can identify it before it happens. But, um, but yeah, you're right. There's definitely an evolving landscape of, of, of kind of threats out there, advanced persistent threats or, or there's mediocre. There's some mediocre persistent threats too. Um, yeah, so... It's really based on, um, so we have a set of rules that based on some of the data that we'll get out of Audit D, right? So um, you could write a rule that, you know, let's say that you set up a user that you, um, let's say that you set up a honeypot, right? So there's a machine that has a user with a known weak password. You could, you know, set up an alert in ThreatStack that says, you know, any anything that this user does, just alert me on it, right? Um, so, you know, we do, we ship a bunch of alerts out of the box um, and then we work with you to kind of customize, you know, what makes sense for your environment and, you know, what, you know, how does, how does your workload run? Um, That's actually a really good point, which is for some companies uh, running uh, Nginx, for example, that's normal. Right, they have that's that's their maybe web server or reverse proxy they're using, um, but for other companies, if they saw Nginx running, that could actually indicate a breach or a threat. Right, uh, for some companies, running Netcat um, is not great, uh, but Netcat is a really powerful tool for for debugging um, kind of network connections. So, you, you well, one of the one of the my favorite rules um, that I'm I'm kind of writing right now is like certain classes of servers should not be running GCC like ever, right? <laughs> like, yeah. That would be an indicator of compromise to me, right? So uh, you for any of the compiler tools like on certain servers, like that, that just should be a sub one because that means somebody is uh, trying to maybe do like a proof of concept exploit or something like that. So I, I kind of focus more on the, the rule sets as like, these are things that I don't want to see happen in my environment 
or I know that they happen and I want to suppress certain types of them um, and everything else I'm concerned about. So it's it's not signature based, which is nice. It's just based on, you know, we have some basic rules um, for tools that are uh, typically associated with exploits and stuff like that. You but know, also a really basic rule if you're trying to identify for data exfiltration, you know, for, all, for again, Linux is what we're talking about there are usually only so many ways to like get data off of a Linux server. And so if we basically look for those processes and we start seeing usage of, of various tools that could exfiltrate data, you know, we can... Or even just that. connections outside my... Like IP range, yeah, my, exactly. My LAN, right? Like that's probably bad too. Um, so there's there's a whole way that you can start to customize and think about how, you, you know, these things. One of my favorite ones is in the in the one that I use as my biggest input to the security program is sudo. I want to see when people are doing privilege escalation. I want to see what they're doing, when they're doing it, why they're doing it. And I, I alert on those because I want to find ways to reduce that, right? So it turns into a good way of identifying potential manual events happening in your environment. You know, we we did a, a webinar with, with a, a customer quite a while ago and, and the way they actually used ThreatStack was interesting in that it was a company that had been around for a very long time. And so just like most companies, you have turnover, the people who maybe created the thing are no longer there. And it allowed them to kind of bubble up this visibility around operational manual tasks that were going on in their environment, like user edits a file, restarts a service. You know, they don't tell anyone they did it because it's something they've been doing forever, but it's it's happening, it's not visible. No one knows that, that this is actually something, It's it, the term I think that was pop, uh, popularized in the Google SRE book is toil, right? It's, right. A, it's a thing you spend time on that is not moving the business forward, right? So it's kind of identifying those scenarios as well is pretty helpful. Well, and, and you think about you know, well, does, is ThreatStack finding, you know, all of these threats across all these infrastructure, like all these customers? And, you know, yes. Uh, but I think the more interesting output of ThreatStack is what are people doing with infrastructure that maybe we need to uh, optimize for, right? Like, you know, companies have said, oh, we, we have a CI system. We know that our code is being deployed in this particular way. And then they install ThreatStack and it's like, well, actually, um, Sam logs in and SCPs a file over to deploy that app because the CI system has been broken for, you know, X amount of uh, weeks, right? So it, it's that visibility and it's not necessarily, uh, you know, vulnerabilities. It's just breakdowns in process and and I have this whole thing that I've I've thought about for a while that's like good operations tends to lead to good security right like if you're doing all of the good operation stuff you have made it sufficiently more difficult for an adversary to do something bad right if you're doing regular patching if you're doing uh, you know limiting pseudo access you're probably in a better spot than a large percentage of, of, of other people and adversaries are going to go for an easy target. Yeah, it's kind of the old world of, and this is very like 90s or early aughts, right, of the, you get root, right? It was all about getting root. That mm. was the old school, the old school hacker days. Because if you got root on a host, you probably got mail server, file server, I mean, DNS server. You, if you got root on one server, you probably had access to a lot of stuff. Um, in, in the current model, and, and even in a lot of ways, the future model, this, this gets more challenging on both sides. You have tools like Kubernetes where um, you're scheduling processes to run across a series of hosts. Um, and so what host, what container is doing which which act, you know file system activities or, or network connections and things like that. And it ran on host A, you know, last second, but then it got scheduled again and it ran on host D. Um, and so, you know, how do you how do you get visibility kind of into that world? And you know, it's it's something that um, it's it's always fun at ThreatStack because we're you know, trying to see how people kind of do their operations in order to, um, you know, help make it easier to get that visibility. Like what is actually going on? Who is doing these things? And, and how can we, you know, maybe not do that anymore? That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> and what are some of the most common types of vulnerabilities that you've noticed in customer environments? I, I kind of go back to the what we just said, you know, it's it's the... You know, it's less vulnerabilities, um, though, you know, I, I have seen the 
uh, you know, the example that I gave at the beginning where it was kind of like, yeah, you know, your web server is running Bash all of a sudden and running PSAUX, right? Like, that seems weird. So, you know, that kind of just kind of comes to my mind naturally as I, you know, something that I've seen before. Um, but also, you know, it's, it's mostly the breakdown of, of people in process. Um, it, it's, it's not necessarily like one single vulnerability or, you know, I, I look at all the data and, and say and say something like, oh, a bunch of people are running this version of Linux. That's that's not you know quite what what I focus on. I'm I'm more interested in the behaviors of of users and, and how they're using infrastructure. It's interesting too because the most likely place you're going to get hacked is via probably email. Um, and the the outcome of that is probably someone paying an invoice to someone they shouldn't pay an invoice to. Actually, a friend of mine just told me the other day about how they got um, basically a breach. I guess you'd call it a breach where they someone paid an invoice that was from a scammer. Um, you know, so those I think are are pretty often the case. What I think is interesting, especially in this kind of cloud world, is you hear a lot of people talk about, you know, kind of immutable infrastructure, you know, the great and glorious world where, you know, you, you pre-build your images in advance and you deploy them and they, they never change in production. Um, it's that never change in production part that I always find to be kind of funny because what, and I actually had a conversation um, with some operations folks in that one. They, I was spending some time doing some testing around kind of in-place kernel updates. Um, there was... As many people know, vulnerabilities in the Linux kernel, we want to patch those vulnerabilities by updating the kernel. And um, I was spending a good amount of time testing this because we have a lot of databases and these databases have a lot of data. There's a cost of everything in Amazon. So it is not financially viable to say, I'm gonna roll up an entirely new Cassandra cluster and copy over a few hundred terabytes of data. Um, Cause there's a, there's a cost to running two clusters. There's a cost of copying that data. Um, it, all, it all costs money and time as well. But, um, you know, the, the response from this engineer was like, oh, well, like at previous company, we just used to build AMIs uh, with the new version of everything. And I was like, yeah, we do that here. And then for systems that are easy to roll, like stateless systems, like roll the new host, roll out the old host, call it a day. Um, but the thing that I worry about most often is, um, you know, people build those AMIs with the latest, especially cloud native type companies with the latest bits they deploy them out and they run for a period of time and maybe they're not doing something just as simple as enabling nightly security updates, um, which then take the latest update. Um, and there's two schools of thought on something as simple as kind of nightly security updates. Maybe on one hand, you don't like you want to deploy um, updated versions of, of your OS software at the same time as you do a software deploy, which is that's great, you know, test it in dev push it all in one batch. I think that's a great idea. But the other way is that, you know, I would rather take the latest version of whatever is coming out in, you know, specifically, let's say like Ubuntu, you know, security updates or, you know, um, CentOS security updates. I'd rather take the most recent version of all of those um, whenever they're available, just to try to stay kind of one step ahead and not, uh, and really just not have to think about like, what is my patch management strategy? Um, I can let kind of the OS take care of it. And in terms of the data infrastructure or the anomaly detection mechanisms or even just the business aspects of growing and managing the business, what have you found to be the most challenging aspects, whether in the past, current, or that you're facing going forward? Um, yeah, so I'll give my most challenging. I think the most challenging, honestly, is uh, is really around the people side. It's, um, you know, for any company growing and scaling, the hardest part's always finding people. So, um, and, and you know, kind of finding the right people at the right time with the right experience. Um, you know, the challenge that we're dealing with is um, is different in a lot of ways. And so we, we often tell people, you know, when they come on board ThreatStack, it's like, oh, you know, you know, it takes a good three to six months to really kind of fully ramp up and get up to speed. And, and so often people are like, oh, like, yeah, I'll, I'll be up to speed in no time. And then when they start seeing like the scope of data and the amount of data and the fact that the data grows just exponentially every every week, every week there's more customers and there's more agents and there's more data. So you're, you're kind of battling both, you know, change, inherent change in scale, as well as just, well, there's some new features we want to push, things like that. Although Pat, I think, has the probably the best example, which is the... You know, have you ever recreated your your software before, right? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, as we've grown, one of the things that we had to do is is figure out how do we monitor ourselves with our own tool. And we were doing this for a while in, in a way that I would describe as uh, not optimal. So, you know, one of the things that we did was you know, we rebuilt ThreatStack in a new AWS account so that we could use it for monitoring, for testing, for um, you know, kind of like a UA environment, but also, you know, with my security hat on so that I have a environment that's stable, that I can understand what's going on inside the company, right? Um, so rebuilding ThreatStack from scratch. <laughs> was... Which is, it's it's funny too, because, you know, for kind of example, our, our, our development environment is hundreds of servers. Um, and so when you, when you think of yourself like you're a large SaaS platform, you're a hosted platform for customers, you know, could you essentially from scratch rebuild that? Because they oftentimes you build the first thing and they evolve over time, many over many years maybe. And so like, could you go and start from scratch and rebuild it all again, right? Um, which it was a very interesting exercise. Um, it sure was. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of fun as well. I mean, it's, it's always fun to go through those, uh, go through those processes. And what are some of the projects that you have planned going forward to improve your overall capacity or the feature set or capabilities in your infrastructure and in your product? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So, um, you know, we're, we're constantly looking at how we kind of store and manage the, the wealth of data we have, um, you know, for uh, different databases. We use a lot of different databases and it's not a bad thing because, um, you know, Postgres might be very good at handling some types of data, but Cassandra might be very good at handling other types. Um, we've been playing around with databases like Druid, which we've heard a lot of good things about um, for, you know, kind of handling and processing data. Um, Flink was the kind of the newest uh, way in which we've been um, kind of toying around with how do we how do we process data um, and, and manage it as well. Um, but then you know just essentially we it's it's very fun because we get to try things out very safely. We can you know kind of we do a concept called dark shipping where we might dark ship a, a new database or a new feature um, where we can actually put it under a production load for you know, uh, for those terms and, and see how it reacts and run queries against it in ways that are not kind of impactful to our customers. Um, and we can see like, well, you know, this database is, you know, the queries in this database is, you know, a few hundred milliseconds, that's perfect. But in this other database, it's, you know, thousands of milliseconds, uh, you know, maybe that's not ideal for us. So, um, so there's always looking at different ways to store data and to, to also be able to do it cost effectively, whether that means, you know, is S3 a great place to store data that maybe is infrequently accessed um, or for things that are very infrequently accessed, things like Glacier, um, you know, make it cost effective to store a lot of data. Um, but, uh, but yeah, for the most part, you know, we're, the nice thing is we're at a size where I usually like to use the term is we're just moving the ball down the field a little bit, you know, and these slow kind of continual improvements in how we process data and what the infrastructure looks like, where um, you know Kafka has been a great success over the last year. You know we're going to be bringing in much more of it, and we want to um, you know we, we like the durability and the failure patterns of it, and, and kind of investing more time there. Um, and then even on the um, kind of operational side, um, improving some things like service discovery. Um, we use Chef for configuration management, and as many people um, in the chef community, you end up using like chef search, using the chef server as a source of truth. Um, we've been toying around with tools like console in order to store um, services and, and discover those. Um, and even tools like Terraform, you know, Terraform has a good community around it. We've decided to, you know, spend some time migrating from CloudFormation, which is great because it can help you build stuff on Amazon, but Terraform can actually help you build things on more than just Amazon, which is, uh, which is nice to kind of get that stuff into code somewhere. So um, it's it's really kind of just, you know, this this interesting, slow, fun, uh, you know, iterative improvement on just how we get work done, for lack of a better word. And are there any other topics that we should discuss before we start to close out the show? That's a good question. I don't know. We went through a lot. Yeah. I can't think of anything. So for anybody who wants to follow the work that you're both up to and get in touch or uh, keep up to date with ThreatStack, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And as a final question, I'm wondering if you can share your perspective on what you view as the biggest gap in the current tooling or technology for data management. 
Yeah, I got one for this one. Um, so I, I really like Kafka. I really like how reliable it is. I like uh, everything about it except managing it. Um, so when I think of like the command line tooling for you know reassigning stuff, it's a lot of uh, you know pipe out this JSON and then edit oh. this JSON and that's actually a really good point. Which is the biggest gap is uh, many databases are uh, I guess they are designed operationally poorly. Um, good examples as I can explain it like Spark. Um, involves like shuffling bits around and having like host files set up and operationally it's it's not fun to manage. Uh, Cassandra equally as well, ways in which you have to define the ring via, it's defined via like IP address, which if you control your IP addresses in your own data center, then it's great. But if you're on the cloud and you know, this is like pre-elastic network interface, you may not control your IP addresses. And so how do you manage that? Yeah. But yeah, Pat brings up a great point, which is there are databases that I would say are very operationally friendly because maybe they have fantastic APIs. Um, like Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch has great yeah. APIs. Um, and it makes it very, um, at least again, from my perspective as a longtime user of Elasticsearch, trivial to manage. But uh, as a new person into uh, Cassandra, when I started Thrust Stack in 2014, and now Kafka, um, these are these are interesting in that they really lack good tools around them, at least at this point. So you know, if if anyone any one of your listeners out there is building some new software for uh, managing data, um, either build really good APIs so other people can create tools, or you know basically build good tools on top of it for like people to actually manage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank the both of you for taking the time out of your day to join me and talk about the work you're doing at ThreatStack. It's definitely an interesting problem space and an interesting solution. So I appreciate your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Thank you. You too, man. Yeah. Thanks for having us. This is awesome. <laughs>